I'd like to thank the Jordan Center and Alexander Shipchanik and Russian Jagov in particular for making it possible for the five of us to discuss our books, all of which came out in 2020, 2021, in which address similar but far from overlapping or duplicated topics. Soviet internationalism, particularly as it pertains to interactions between Soviet or Soviet-based coming and cultural agencies within European cultures, but more particularly with what has more recently been called the Global South. Several had wanted to set up a book launch for our books at the last year's ASIS convention, but COVID has essentially put a kibosh on that. Today's events is our plan B, though certainly no surrogate for a launch. Instead of meeting, meeting in a crowded room where people in varying degrees of, of, of um, inebriation are packed in and it's hard to get myself heard over the din, we have, thanks to the Jordan Center, an opportunity to sit down and if virtually mull over what we have individually and collectively produced. This forum also gives us a chance to interact with readers and potential readers whose comments and questions will bring us further to further reflection and foster our future work. In my case, I'm actually working at the moment on a book about Chingiz Atmat of the Kyrgyz writer. We come before you as a group, and we are a group that are far flung and loosely composed. Behind all four books stand a series of conferences and other forums where in each case, several of us interacted. For me, important such conferences include one on Russia's interactions with East Asia, which Edward organized at Columbia in 2015, and two conferences, one in 2015 and one in 2017, that Stephen and Amelia organized at Berkeley. Many of the papers given at those two conferences, the two conferences at Berkeley, are incorporated in their jointly edited comments on aesthetics, though they've been augmented with other articles commissioned to expand the range of the book's coverage. We also have been trading common terrain in that most of these books focus on the interwar years, but, but not only. Rossin, for example, focuses more on the post-war years when the Comintern no longer existed, though his initial chapter covers the interwar years when the Comintern played such a major role in leftist culture throughout most of the world. Speaking for myself, my book, Eurasia Without Borders, um, and, and uh, the idea for writing my book came to me in 2006 when I was teaching at Peking University on the Yale program. At the time I was finishing my book, Moscow, the Fourth Rome, so I decided to look at the university's archives and see if I could find anything there about the 16 months period that one of my principals in the book, Sergei Tretyakov, spent teaching at Peking University in 24, 25. I didn't find much to my disappointment, but this focus on his time in Peking threw into focus, uh, through the relief, the whole phenomenon of the Soviet cultural incursions into Asia and the dream of fostering what in the book I call a literary commons. My book is heavily um, based on archival sources, but several other trips to Asia re reignited my enthusiasm. They include a trip to India in, 19 in 2013 to attend a conference in Shantini Ketan, headquarters of Chagor's educational establishments, to participate in a conference marking the 100th anniversary of his receiving the Nobel Prize for Literature. When in Kolkata en route, I was befriended by the great Indian scholar of Russia, Harif Sudavan, tragically since a victim of COVID, who gave me a guided tour of intellectual centers in the city, particularly of the Asiatic Society, one of the pioneer institutions for world literature and also for the study of Indo-European linguistics. And then I was fortunate enough to be invited to, to Istanbul in 2015 to attend a conference on Nazim Hikmet held at Bogoshit University. While there, a fellow participant arranged for me to access to the archives on Hikmet that that, that, that university had acquired from Russia. And last but no means least, a spin off from the conference that Stephen and Amelia organized, Stephen and I, together with the invaluable Bo Zhang, a fellow participant in those conferences, um, con uh, and a contributor to Common Tony Aesthetics, uh, invaluable as a speak only speaker of Chinese amongst us, we undertook a pilgrimage in June 20, uh, in, in, uh, to Yunnan, the Chinese Communist headquarters. For much, which served as the Chinese Communist headquarters for much of the late 1930s and early 1940s. In Yunnan, we saw not only the cave apartments where the Communists lived, but also the Lushun Academy of the Arts, Lui, which was founded in April 1938, about three miles from the city in an abandoned Catholic monastery. There we visited the Academy's museum, where thanks to both interpreting, I was able to make, take copious notes about theater productions and other Soviet-inspired cultural activities in Yunnan. I know Stephen is going to tell us more about this memorable trip and even treat you to photographs. <laughs>
All this help and the help of many more scholars, graduate students and members of my principal author's families has been crucial because truest confessions, I don't know any Asian languages, only European. And though I did struggle to learn Chinese uh, during my stint at Peking University. One of my interview reviewers has called my book bold and bold it is, but, or perhaps rather foolhardy, but I took the plunge. I've compensated for the lack in, in, uh, of, of language facility in part, thanks to the help of many scholars and graduate students, among them ex the extremely generous Rossin. So what is the book about? It opens with a declaration made by um, Nikolai, Mikhail Pavlovich, a leading Bolshevik authority on Eastern affairs, which uh, on September the 1st, 1920, to what was called the Congress of Peoples of the East, held in Baku. Um, this declaration, this in his speech, uh, Pavlovich presented a rosy uh, picture of a, quote, new culture that would emerge and, and would be developed by, quote, hundreds of millions of Asian in concert with the European proletariat. In his utopian scenario, quotes, all the individual streams will in the most marvelous way and harmoniously intermingle with the waves of a single common international ocean of poetry and knowledge of the toiling humanity who, who've been freed from national and class oppression for the first time and who will shine with such hitherto unseen beauty, the likes of which neither classical Greece achieved with all its divine works of art nor the civilizations of the Middle Ages and capitalist epochs with all their pleiad of immortal poets, artists, thinkers, and scholars. This was indeed a bold declaration. One that ignored such obvious problems as the lack of a common language, already glaring apparent at the conference itself, and the cultural divisions and very different traditions of both within Asia and between Asia and Europe, not to mention the theory of distance and the widespread illiteracy. But then there are problems of another order. How could this interweaving or, or pity pitsats, it's interweaving or intermingling be affected? Would it be organized in a top-down pattern with instructions, examples, and so on, emanating from Moscow? Would the great international ocean currents draw the waves towards Moscow? At Baku, Pavlovich envisioned not only a post-imperial culture, but also a post-historical one. Karl Schmidt and others have characterized the ocean as a place without borders that functions in an eternal present. An ocean is an almost abstract featureless space with no interior borders. The cultures of Eurasia were to amalgamate and in leasty like expanse of water and ocean, uh, differences would be dissipated in the ephemeral waves. Though this issue is not raised in Pavlov's speech, Pavlov's speech, an implicit question is, would this ocean have currents that would draw the waves to Moscow as a gravitational center? Nevertheless, during the interwar years, something like what was initially called a Lithuanian town, a Lithuanian international, did emerge, if, if in faltering fashion. It was almost, it was most in evidence in the 1930s, when spurred in part by the, the by widespread abhorrence of the Nazi takeover in Germany in 1933, the Spanish Civil War in 36-39, and the Sino-Japanese War of 37-45, writers all over the world were moved to join literary organizations linked with the common term. The book's temporal parameters are 1919 to 1943, the dates of the Comintern's existence. But as I argue, this movement cannot be defined, the, the movement that I'm describing in the book, cannot be defined by the parameters of the Comintern's organizations and reach. I draw a distinction in the book between two categories of participants in this literary commons. On the one hand, what I call members of the literary internationalists, um, uh, uh, literary internationalists who were committed to the Soviet cause and, then, and, and were members of the or common term cultural bodies on the one hand, and on the other, what I call the Yikumen, comprising a large number of writers and artists who may or may not have been found formally affiliated with any common term sponsored literary body. Um, some drifted in and out of such organizations, but whose self identities were not so circumscribed. Other institutions, uh, the, which, are, which I discuss in the book and which are active in this movement, uh, include Vox, the All Union uh, Society for Cultural Links with Abroad, and KUTV, the Communist University of Tullus of the East. This account, so far, my account suggests that my book is an institutional history. But though it traces that history over the interwar years, its center of gravity is less the institutional history than an account of how individual writers responded to versions of the mandate presented by Pavel Richard Bakhtu, how they attempted to reconcile the Asian and the European literary worlds and cultural traditions in the name of a quote-unquote progressive agenda. 
I consequently organized the, the first half of the book in a series of chapters, each of which covers the dynamic in a different Asian country or cluster of countries. It progresses from west to east with chapters on first Turkey, then Persia, Afghanistan, India, and East Asia, East Asia comprising China, Mongolia, Japan, and French Indochina. Each chapter pairs or contrasts at least two writers, one from the Soviet Union or Europe and the other um, from an Asian country. And it discusses how their work, how in their work they engaged similar or adopted similar, similar issues or adopted similar or dissimilar to strategies. In the case of Turkey, I look, I'm looking at, at Mayakovsky and Azim Hikmet, who collaborated uh, uh, um, on public uh, performances in Moscow in the 1920s. For, for uh, Persia, I'm looking at Khlebnikov and Abokasim Blachuti, who both draw in, drew on in many of their verses on the um, Persian national epic um, of, of, of Ferdowsi, Nahame. And uh, uh, though, though for, in the case of Lahuti, I largely cover his time in Tajikistan, where he functioned as, uh, for most of the 1930s as Mr. Central Asian Literature and number three in the Soviet Writers' Union. Uh, in the case of my initial chapter on India, I looked largely in Indo-Europeanism Indo and its fate in the Soviet Union under the linguist Nikolai Ma, though I also broached theosophy and the artist Nikolai Rerich. Then for East Asia, I look at Tretyakov, Pinyak, Andrei Monroe in, 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 Andre Monro in Indochina, uh, uh, Tretyakov in, um, in China and Mongolia, Pinyak in China, Mongolia and Japan, and also the Chinese communist leader and writer Ku Ku Bai. My chapter on Afghanistan is the one exception to this pattern. I could not find an Afghani writer to pair with my Soviet writer, Elisa Risna, though her larger than life presence there, coupled with lingering attachments to the imperialist exoticism of her erstwhile lover, Nikolai Gumilyov, more than compensates. The second half of the book follows a different pattern. It begins with the Comintern and rap sponsored International Literary Congress held in Kharkov, today's Kharkiv, in November 1930, and attended by delegates from all over the world. At the conference, a new organization, the International Organization of Revolutionary Writers, generally known by its Russian acronym MORP, M -O -R -P, was formed. And in its wake, one after the other, left inclining writers' organizations from different countries joined, including the European, Chinese, Indian, American, and my native Australian. The ensuing three chapters of the book covers the 1930s progressively, chronicling the increasing cohesion of the movement, especially the closer interactions between writers in Europe, the Soviet Union, India, and China. But this increasing cohesion also throws into more relief, the counter increasing cohesion also throws into more relief, several of the issues that were implicit but not acknowledged in the utopian scenarios of Pavlet, um, uh, not, not, not acknowledged in the early post-revolution years. In particular, the issue of whether all the writers in the movement would be obliged to follow a common aesthetic, for example, what Amelia and Stephen have called in the title of their book, Comintern Aesthetics, or Edward, Internationalist Aesthetics. As we know, socialist realism was institutionalized in the Soviet Union between 1932 and 1934, but the Nazi takeover in Germany occurred in the middle of that period. Moreover, the first Congress of, of the Writers' Union was held in August 1934, a little over a year after the takeover, the Nazi takeover, and was attended by several foreign writers who were activists in the anti-fascist movement. What socialist realism to become the common aesthetic of this movement? Karl Rodek certainly thought so, when in his keynote address on foreign literature to the Congress, he set up the alternative choice, quotes, James Joyce or socialist realism. But in fact, most non-Soviet writers dragged their feet in the interwar years about jettisoning James Joyce, and particularly about following the conventions of socialist realism. Some made gestures in that direction, but avoided the standard arc of its master plot. Examples I discuss in the book include the German communist writer Anna Zegers, who wrote extensively on China, and the Indian writer Mukharaj Anand, who is for most of the 1930s a fervent and, and founding, member, founding member and head of India's more affiliated Progressive Writers Association, and a pen of love letters to Soviet literary officialdom. Yet, at the same time, he was a resident of England and incorporated in this literary world, a darling of Bloomsbury and close to such figures as the Wolfs and T.S. Eliot. Anand provides one of many examples in this book that point to the limitations in placing any writer on some putative political comedological spectrum. 
um, of trying to thrust them in, into, into um, uh, such a spectrum. The book was written then not to praise this great experiment or to bury it, though it does discuss how the ecumen began to unravel in the late 1930s as intellectuals recoiled from the Sano's purses and the repressions of Republicans in the Spanish Civil War. Eurasia is about as about borders is not intended to be just an ideological from cultural history. The purpose of the book is, purposes of the book are manifold, but one of them, which I discussed in the introduction, is to fill in a gaping lacuna in the conventional accounts of the evolution of world literature. Um, what emerged progressively in the wake of Baku and subsequent common term sponsored literary congresses was the beginnings of a world literature, world in that encompassed such a broad expanse, both geographically and culturally. It was not the Paris-centered world literature of Pascal Rose Casanova in her book, The World Republic of Letters, though from 1935, the Comintern funded international literary effort was formally centered at Paris. Its purse strings were in Moscow. Um, Casanova's book outlines an, quotes, international literary space occupied by, quotes, a sort of intellectual international. This book describes a Moscow-centered such international that was likewise formed around literature and had a significant presence in the cultural history of the interwar years. This version of world literature, a putative Eurasian red culture, was intended to rival the established Eurocentric literary worlds that Casanova and others describe, and which are centered in places like Paris, London, and Berlin, and dependent on the bourgeois cap capitalist order. We're looking here at a version of world literature in this book in the Eurasia, Euro Asian configuration that would not yet embrace the world in its entirety. European Soviet and Asian leftist writers and their texts would intermingle Piripitatsa, but the international ocean would in practice not yet include African writers and only sporadically Latin American, though they were important in other anti-imperialist movements of these decades. The incorporation of the, in the great ocean of these vast geographical entities came later, after World War II, when during the Soviet Union's big push for dominance in the third world, the geographical purview of Moscow-oriented world literature expanded, it includes those other continents, as Rosin Jagov has outlined in his book, from, post, from internationalism to post-colonialism. Post -colonialism. Moscow-centered literary organizations emerged in the 20s and 30s were overwhelmingly European, or more precisely, Euro-American. When we look at common term cultural efforts in Asia, we're dealing with a comparative backwater. Nevertheless, the inclusion of contemporary Asian literature in the international ocean, however reduced, marks a significant step in the evolution of world literature as we know it today. This book then makes a contribution to the prehistory of world literature. It explores a missing link between world literature as it emerged in the late 18th and early 19th centuries and world literature as it preoccupied theorists and cultural historians in recent decades. In the late 18th and early 19th century, several intellectuals were taken by a number of Asian classics and sought to incorporate them in European literature to create a world literature. Goethe, for example, proposed including the Chinese novel, the verse of Hafiz, and other Persian poets, and the play Shakuntala, derived from the great Sanskrit epic, the Mahabharata. But the Asian texts promoted then came from the classical heritage of their respective cultures, or, in, or the past at any rate, and were tastefully remote, remote in time from then contemporary European literature. Moreover, there were major lacunae in Goethe's acquaintance with the main classics of Asian literature. As David Amrish has argued, Goethe is no multiculturalist. Western Europe maintains, so remains the privileged modern world of reference for him, and Greece and Rome provide the crucial antiquity to which he returns. As Damrish also points out, world literature as it was understood in those days was quote, often closely associated with imperial values. Many of the works by Asians promoted by European writers in the late 18th to early 19th, century, and 19th centuries had been translated into European languages by agents of imperial bodies, especially of the East India Company. Also, conversely, colonial powers played a major role in the Europeanization of non-European literatures. The case of Lord Thomas Babington Macaulay, who imposed English literature on his Indian subjects being most infamous. In the early 20th century, some Euro prominent European literary intellectuals um, made gestures toward European, Euro Asian literature, but they essentially built on the example of Goethe and others from this earlier period, largely experimenting with adaptations of classical verse and drama from Asian literatures. Well known examples include Pound and Penlos's appropriation of Chinese and Japanese poetry and the continuing vogue for Persian poetry with the Havas and so forth, and for ancient Sanskrit texts and Indian spirituality. Sagor, the Ibongoli writer who became a cult figure in the 1910s among Europeans, 
might seem to be an exception in that he was one of the few contemporary Asian writers the, that European pundits promoted. But while the Soviet Union would honor Tagore as an anti-imperialist and foreground his novels, which proselytized for modern ideas of women's liberation, in the West, enthusiasts focused on his poetry, which they incorporated in narratives about ancient Indi Indian Sanskrit spirituality. Um, in my epilogue, the epilogue to Eurasia Wealth Borders, I take my story further into the post-war years, outlining somewhat sketchily a new post comintern but Moscow-funded um, literary movement centered around um, the Afro-Asian Writers' Association, founded in Tashkent in 1958. But Rosen covers uh, this, this uh, deal much more thoroughly in his work. In this epilogue, I point to continuities in the personnel and the organization of, of, of um, the Afro-Asian Writers' Association, but also the radical changes in comparing the, the work of the Afro-Asian Writers' Association and the, um, the Comintern-funded bodies of the interwar period, not the least of which is the way Western writers fell by the wayside under the, from, from the movement under the impact of the Cold War, many joining the <clears throat> CIA-sponsored Congress for Cultural Af Freedom, while African writers, nowhere in evidence in the interwar period, became prominent in this, this movement. But several writers who joined the Afro-Asian Writers Association, such as Ngugi Wa Siongo, became major players in world literature, as has emerged to promise in the 1970s and beyond. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop my coverage there because I'm looking for, very much forward to hearing the comments, not only of, my, of my, my colleagues on this panel, but also of the audience. Um, so at this I will end, thank you. Thank you ever so much, Katie. Next, we have Edward. Thank you, Rosson. Um, and can everybody hear me? Yeah. Um, thank you very much for, uh, to Rosson and to the Jordan Center for organizing this wonderful event and for asking me to be a part of it. I have to say this is an especial pleasure for, for many reasons, perhaps the central one of which is that I think that work on literary and cultural internationalism by its very nature, has to be collaborative and has to be collective for the simple reason that no one person could possibly do it all. Um, we, I think we need to create some sort of composite image of this very complex system of, of global networks and inter interactions that makes up something that we might call uh, socialist cultural internationalism. Um, and in that regard, you know, as, as Katie has already indicated, I hope that our work can always be seen as as complementary rather than competitive. Uh, and, and I also want to add that Rosson's book is a sort of silent presence here, as, as Katie has also mentioned, um, and really sort of fills in this picture in a very important way uh, through to the post-war period. So um, we each agreed, I think, that we might say a few words to sort of position ourselves in relationship to the previous speaker and the previous talk. Um, so I might just say a few words uh, about my work's relationship to, to Katie's book. I mean, Katie's work has been foundational for me as it has for many scholars of early Soviet culture. Um, and I actually learned that she was working on um, a similar topic quite early on in the dissertation work that eventually led to this, to this book. Um, and we were in, in touch and she was very generous about accommodating and working around the work of a much junior, much more junior scholar. Um, she sat on my dissertation committee and has been generally comradely uh, in various ways. If I was to, to pinpoint sort of differences in focus between the two books, um, what I hope makes them complementary rather than clashing, uh, I would say, first of all, that uh, Katie's book takes up a much greater geographical and historical breadth. Um, this kind of sweep that she achieves is truly remarkable and something before which I can only, only bow down in, uh, in, in, in humility. Uh, but also she, quite brilliantly, I think, brings into view um, the complex uh, networks and institutional structures that together made up this somewhat fragile, often flickering um, ecumene uh, of interwar literary internationalism, this vision of red Eurasian culture never quite achieved um, of as an ocean uh, which erases borders, but may still in some sense be shaped by currents, uh, perhaps even whirlpools uh, that recenter Moscow at the heart of the ocean. Um, 
for myself, methodologically, I'm also very invested in the book in archival work, um, if we can even talk about that in the present tense anymore, and uh, in the ways in which cultural agents, texts, and ideas move across borders. So I talk a lot about translation uh, in the book, for example, it's a particular dynamic for structuring what I call international aesthetics. Um, but in the book, I tend to drill down quite a lot, perhaps at times too much, um, into quite close readings of particular texts, films, and plays, um, trying to combine the detailed history of the often transnational dynamic of their production with an account of their formal innovations, tensions, and contradictions. And fundamentally, uh, rather than focusing, for example, on the paradigm of world literature, I think I'm really interested in making arguments about the relationship between uh, political ideology and uh, aesthetic form. So following Frederick Jameson's redeployment of Levi-Strauss's analysis of the structure of myth, it was the imaginary resolution of social contradictions, uh, but also the kind of materialization of, of those contradictions. I argue that Soviet art and literature about China uh, from the 1920s and early 30s gave expression to the political contradictions of, of Comintern internationalism. Um, now, Robert Young, in tracing the genealogy of post-colonial thought back to early Soviet internationalism, identifies in the political history of the Comintern what he calls a constant tension between centripetal and centrifugal forces, uh, between a vertical hierarchy and a horizontal network. So on the one hand, socialist internationalism envisioned a horizontal form of solidarity that could generate a global network of anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist actors across national, cultural, or racial borders. On the other hand, the historical primacy of the October Revolution and the domination of the common term by the Soviet Communist Party tended to recenter Moscow as the leader of the global revolution, a trend that increased with the onset of the Stalinist period. So my central claim, I would say, is that this, precisely this tension between centrifugal and centripetal forces also structured the formal innovations and contradictions of what I call internationalist aesthetics, sometimes consciously, uh, as a deliberate attempt to work through these problems, sometimes unconsciously as an unresolved remainder of imperialist thinking within an ostensibly internationalist casing. The first question I want to think about really is why China, right? Um, why rather than focusing on very different global places, do I privilege China in what I call internationalist aesthetics? Well, partly this is a question of political urgency. So China, as Asia's largest country, offered a prime testing ground for the Leninist strategy of supporting bourgeois nationalist revolutions in colonized and semi-colonized countries. China was in the 20s politically divided following its Republican Revolution in 1911, and the unequal treaties signed with foreign powers over the previous 80 years had given Western capital a major foothold in China's economy, operating through treaty ports such as Shanghai. Uh, beginning in 1923, Comintern advisors led by Mikhail Baradin and Vatsili Blucher worked with the Chinese Nationalist Party, or Guomindang, uh, in their base at Guangzhou and helped the Guomindang to develop a modern army that could potentially retake the entire country. The recently reformed Chinese Communist Party was pushed into an uncomfortable alliance with the Nationalists, uh, which in 1927 fell apart. After retaking Shanghai in April of that year, the Guomindang leader Chiang Kai-shek launched a massacre of communist armed workers in, Shanghai's large, in China's largest city. Uh, the Comintern advisors were driven out of the country, uh, quite literally in the case of Baradin and his, uh, of, and his companions who were forced to flee through the Gobi Desert by car. But this ultimately failed political project coincided with a cultural project, a concerted state-supported effort to transform the relationship of the Soviet public to China. Soviet writers and filmmakers were dispatched to China to report on what seemed to be the next phase of world revolution. Theatres in Moscow staged plays and ballets about contemporary China and consulted Chinese students about folk songs and stage design. But besides the simple topicality of the China theme, my central claim is that China was the space where the political question of internationalism most consistently became an aesthetic question of form and mediation. Across the genres and media of the new Soviet society, from travel writing, fiction and biography, to theater, ballet, and documentary film, the question of how to represent the world for a Soviet audience was closely bound up with the question of how to connect that audience to China. And this aesthetic urgency of the Chinese case was driven above all by the sense that China had already been aestheticized, but in the wrong way. 
So the most important figure for this project, uh, already mentioned by Katie, and the central figure in the book is Sergei Tretyakov, uh, a writer and theorist who played a key role in the early Soviet and ready European leftist avant-garde, uh, alongside more famous colleagues and friends such as Mayakovsky, Eisenstein, Rodchenko, and Brecht. Tretyakov spent 18 months teaching Russian at Beijing University uh, in 1924 to 25. And here he is at Beijing University. Um, and became the foremost Soviet voice on China in this period. For Tretyakov, only a documentary approach grounded in direct contact with contemporary China and collaboration with Chinese interlocutors could overturn the exotic fetishization of China and the Russian and European popular culture of the early 20th century. So, for example, in the first lines of his programmatic essay, Loving China, um, or Lubit Kitai, which was published in 1925, uh, Tretyakov offers an ironic summary of the false image of China that dominates the popular imagination. I'll, I'll read the English. A mysterious country, an inscrutable people. Chinese porcelain, Chinese shadows, Chinese silk, Chinese tea, the Chinese wall, Chinese writing, Chinese umbrellas. Ah, those refined Chinese torches, the Chinese princess Turan Dot, porcelain nodding dolls, Chinese fans, Chinese gowns, ah, opium dens, groans in addition a sensitive laywoman attracted to the theater and exotic books this is the knowledge of china held by 90 percent of our average citizens so in this passage Tretikov presents china's social reality as mystified uh, by a, a regime of commodified exoticism beyond its primary impenetrability china is experienced through its commodities the famous exports such as porcelain silk and tea that proved so popular and so profitable in the European world. Of course, under the Marxist notion of commodity fetishism, the commodity form obscures the social nature of production relations precisely by disguising the social labor that produces the object. Through the mediation of exchange value, a social relationship between people becomes a rarefied relationship between things. Expanding this logic to the case of China, Tretyakov is suggesting here that a commodified China becomes not a human population coexisting alongside and interconnected with their Soviet contemporaries, but rather a set of objects to be purchased and consumed. This rarefication expands into the realm of the cultural imaginary, where a sequence of fragmented synecdoches stand in the center of shadows, great war, parasols, fans, opium debts. These images of China circulate through a transnational cultural economy whose center is Western Europe. Uh, and elsewhere, Tretyakov directs particular ire at French writers such as Pierre Loti, Claude Ferrer, Gustave Mirbeau, all purveyors of what Jonathan Spence has called the French exotic in their popular writings on China. So both Chinese commodities and images of China circulate through a global capitalist economy that rarefies China as consumable exotica and mystifies its contemporary reality. Through this rarefication, the Chinese people themselves are effaced. Their true position in the global system is concealed. Now, Tretyakov's work on China stands at the beginning of his commitment to what would later in the decade become known as factography, or the literature of fact, a form of writing that rejects fiction and insists on the fixation of facts as the correct form for a post-revolutionary literature. Tretyakov's factographic method, I suggest, begins as a method for overcoming the exoticization of a foreign space. This fetishistic relationship the public currently has with China must be replaced with a sense of connection between human subjects experiencing commensurable forms of revolutionary change. China in the 1920s was, not unlike its Soviet neighbor, a place of political transformation and cultural radicalism. The Republican Revolution of 1911 to 12 had toppled the Qing dynasty but failed to produce a stable new order, with warring military factions competing for control of the state. The intellectual debates of the new culture movement in the 1910s and the May 4th movement of the 1920s had criticized Confucian tradition and opened themselves to a vast range of intellectual influences abroad. And notably, this included a significant turn at this time among Chinese intellectuals towards Russian literature as well as Soviet Marxism. For example, while he was in Beijing, Tretyakov um, helped out Lu Xun, um, the, the, most, the foremost Chinese writer of this period, and himself a committed reader in translation of Russian literature, um, who at that time was engaged in the translation into Chinese of Alexander Bloch's poem The Twelve. So Tretyakov's task is to convince his readers, as he puts it later in this same essay, that fantasy is more gray than reality. In other words, the reality of China's tempestuous revolutionary entry into modernity 
is more exciting and more worthy of engagement than the hallucinatory falsities of exoticism. This work requires an active disruption of acquired knowledge and existing stereotypes. An elegant example of this practice, and another small example from the book that I want to share, can be found on the cover of Zhongguo, uh, which is Tretikov's book of sketches about China, published in 1927, with this very striking cover design by Alexander Rochenko. The Tretikov's title here, Zhongguo, is a Cyrillic transliteration of Zhongguo, um, which means central state or middle kingdom, uh, and is the modern name for the Chinese state in Chinese. Tretikov chooses Zhongguo here in place of the Russian word Kitai, um, the Russian name for China, which does not actually correspond to any name in Chinese for the Chinese state. Um, it actually comes from the Khitan, who were a Mongol people who ruled much of northern China uh, in the um, early from the 12th, 10th to 12th century. So Kitai, uh, in alignment with this earlier analysis of commodification and exoticism, Kitai here signifies or would signify the accumulated meanings that have accrued around China in the Russian cultural context. Uh, in other words, precisely this exotic commodification of Kitai as fans, silk, turandot, etc. Tretikov's rejection of Kitai expresses his ambition to convey China on its own terms, freed from these exotic distortions. Nonetheless, the first encounter with Zhongguo here in Cyrillic, for most readers of Russian, will probably cause a sense of confusion and estrangement, um, similar in some ways to the futurist practice of Zaum or transrational language. Let's remember that Tretikov was uh, in his early stage of his career, a futurist poet. Russian readers seeking traces of the, of the familiar in this unfamiliar term might even grasp for the word chuzhoi, uh, meaning strange or alien, which shares four of its five letters with Zhongguo. However, this strangeness will itself be overcome once the reader understands that Zhongguo transliterates a meaningful semantic unit in Chinese. And Rochenka's cover design, I think, emphasizes this in the way that the illegible Zhongguo actually appears between the two characters in Chinese, Zhong and Guo, um, that render the term. Um, in, in Chinese uh, script, within a design whose balance and sense of symmetry insists upon the theme of equivalence. So here, this avant-garde technique of estrangement works to jolt the reader out of the frame of the familiar exotic, dispelling Kitai and its accumulated cultural baggage, and instead confronting us with a term which is truly foreign, uh, and yet we are reassured visually that this foreignness can be rendered commensurable and comprehensible. So a couple of other things I want to say, particularly about Petikov's um, work and the, how it's structural figure that runs through the book. Uh, and I kind of pair him with other people from this period who are also working on, uh, on these engagements with China. One of the really striking elements of Petikov's work is the sheer range of genres and media across which he worked, um, searching for this a, a correct method for mediating this transforming relationship. Um, and in this regard, you know, my presence on the panel is maybe a little bit of a misnomer in that my the international aesthetics I'm trying to reconstruct is goes beyond the literary and is something of a multimedia project that actually is actively questioning the status of, of literature in relationship to other media at this particular moment, um, this moment of early 20th century transformation in, in the media environment. Um, so mediation, really, in the sense, both in the sense of the writer as a mediator and in the sense of the diverse affects produced by different media, uh, and their political potential is the central concern, really, of the book. Tretikov's own work on China spans poetry, reportage, photography, playwriting, cinema, and collective ethnography, collaborative ethnography. Uh, so in each chapter of the book, I juxtapose some of Tretikov's work in a particular genre or medium to the work of his contemporaries, not all of whom shared his ideological or methodological suppositions. Uh, so in the first chapter, I read Tretikov's poems and sketches about China, um, which appeal to sight and sound in order to convey recognizable process of revolutionary transformation. And actually, I have here some, some of Tretikov's photographs, which are included in his sketches um, as part of this expression of, and kind of capture the visual uh, through the printed orchard. Um, I juxtapose Tretikov's writing sketches about China to the much more radically unstable uh, travel writing of Buddy Spilniak, where disorienting experiences of sight and sound uh, create a sort of wild oscillation between total identification and total alienation. Um, I also talk a little about Pilniak's failed cinema collaboration with two prominent Chinese leftists of that period, Tian Han and Zhang Guangzi, uh, which is an interesting episode that I think illustrates the way in which these very cosmopolitan Chinese intellectuals of the 1920s are both engaging closely with Russian revolutionary experience and actually doing so with quite divergent understandings of um, the relationship between Russian and Chinese revolutions. <clears throat> 
the second chapter of the book is uh, focused on theatre and juxtaposes, juxtaposes two high-profile theatrical productions from the 20s that placed contemporary China on the Soviet stage. Uh, this is a photo from Tretikov documentary play War China, Ri Chi Ki Dai from 1926, uh, which was staged a recent instance of British imperialist violence in China. Um, and this is uh, one of the set designs from The Red Poppy, Krasny Mark from 1927, a ballet about a love affair between a Chinese dancer and a Soviet naval captain that offered a kind of Sovietized Orientalism and indeed became canonized as the first successful Soviet ballet. Chapter three focuses on cinema. Um, here I reconstruct Tretyakov's monumental but sadly unrealized project for a trilogy of films set in contemporary China, which was slated to be directed by Sergei Eisenstein. Uh, and against their totalizing vision, I juxtapose two documentary films that did get made. Uh, the Great Flights from 1925, one of the first Soviet expedition films, which records a pioneering aviation expedition from Moscow across Siberia and Mongolia to Beijing and Shanghai. Um, and secondly, Shanghai Document, uh, which is a spellbinding application of early Soviet montage theory for China's most important semi-colonial city. The final chapter of the book um, considers Tretyakov's most complex experiment in internationalist aesthetics. Um, this, after his return to Moscow, Tretyakov worked with one of his students from Beijing, an aspiring writer named Gao Shuhua, to produce a collaborative account of Gao's life. Um, this experiment in co-authorship, which Tretyakov called a bio-interview, uh, appeared in print under the pseudonym Deng Shuhua and offered Soviet readers an extensive account of contemporary Chinese, si Chinese society as seen from the perspective of a single young life. And here is a photograph, a very strange photograph of Gao Shuhua, which is preserved in Tretyakov's archive, um, which I would be happy to talk more about if people are interested in what's going on here. Um, but the last thing I want to just say uh, about, to try and tie back this question of literary internationalism, cultural internationalism, and the relationship to um, the political forces created by the Comintern, one of the remarkable things I think about Tretyakov's work um, is the series of meta-reflections on his own authority as a mediator of China that he places at the center of that work. Um, so this returns us in a way to this key question of centrifugal versus centripetal forces, right? The tension between the Comintern's ideal of horizontal solidarity and the practical prioritizing of Soviet theory, Soviet experience, and the strategic interests of the Soviet state. Tretyakov's writings on China place this tension between egalitarian solidarity and hierarchical leadership. Core. So he's constantly reflecting on the nature of his own role as a mediator of China, constantly flagging up his limitations as an outsider with limited knowledge of Chinese, uh, even as he asserts a kind of privileged capacity at other moments to interpret Chinese, China's current reality through the lens of the Russian Revolution. At other moments, his claims to analytical insight or artistic veracity are constantly undercut by reminders of his own dependence on Chinese mediators and imperfect processes of translation. And these meta-reflections on authority reach a kind of apotheosis in this bio-interview, Deng Shuhua, which was produced from a series of interviews between Tretyakov and his former student, Gao, over a period of six months. This 300-plus page book ends not with revolutionary triumph uh, or full conversion to the cause of Soviet communism, but rather with confusion and uncertainty. Gao returns to China in 1927 after the Shanghai massacre. Tretyakov loses touch with him, and another student suggests that much of what Gao told his former teacher may have been lies. It remains entirely unclear whether Gao, um, or in the book Dong, uh, the son of a prominent nationalist politician from a scholar gentry family, ever truly became a communist. Besides offering a meditation on the li limitations of the Comintern's project to shape the Chinese revolution, Deng Shihua also functions as a practical course in literary internationalism and its limits. Um, throughout the book, the teacher Tretyakov is seeking through this collaboration to imp impart the principles of factographic writing to his student Gao, who himself was an aspiring realist writer uh, who had already published at least one short story in Chinese and had also translated Russian writers such as Chekhov and Lermontov. And once again, Tretyakov's authority in this regard proved limited. The method that engaged Chinese writers of the period actually took up was realist fiction, uh, the very thing factography sought to move beyond. So these crises of pedagogical authority in Tretyakov's book can be read, I think, as a kind of allegorical response to the defeat of the Comintern's own attempt at building in China, following the Chinese nationalist turn against their communist allies in 1927. 
But Tretyakov also turned defeat into a new method, insisting that a mode of aesthetic production that seeks to be truly internationalist must also be one that questions its own grounds of authority, reveals the transnational nature of its production, um, interrogates the limits of its knowledge, uh, and complicates its right to represent the other. Okay, I will stop there. Um, thanks very much. Thank you, Edward. Uh, now the baton goes to Emilie. Okay. Um, thank you so much for including me in this panel, Russin. Uh, it's such an honor to be speaking with colleagues whose work has long inspired me. Uh, I also wanted to thank you for uh, these fantastic Jordan Center seminars. Um, I'm really happy to be part of one. My students at UC San Diego have been watching them, uh, whether recorded or coming in person, and they've learned so much as a way of supplementing their education. Um, so I'm especially grateful to my colleague, Stephen Lee, who will be speaking right after me and who was the motivating force for our collaboration on common turn aesthetics, which came out two years ago, almost exactly two years ago, and had a direct influence on my own recent book, which focuses on the Yiddish speaking writers affiliated with the common turn and which came out a few months after that. So I'm going to use uh, the time that I have to talk about Jewish writers who were affiliated with the common turn and their development of what I call in the book, poetic passwords to write about non-Jewish groups. Passwords in this context were at the core of the verbal common turn aesthetics of the writers that I'm considering. They were linguistic ciphers to borrow a term that Derrida applied to uh, some of Paul Ceylon's poetry um, that the leftist writers used to build internationalist works. So I'll focus my comments today on the Yiddish writers uh, that, I'm, that I'm talking about in this book. These, uh, these were left-wing poets who wrote about other groups' struggles. The early uprisings in East Asia in the 1920s, the Spanish Civil War, Jim Crow in the American South, the frustrations of the Palestinian Arabs and Ukrainian peasants, to name a few of the groups that, that I consider. The writers that I'm looking at all wrote in Yiddish. This is the Germanic language that was spoken in Jewish communities in Europe for about a thousand years until World War II. Um, in a very polarizing moment, these party aligned writers were changing the meaning of group identity. They were choosing to make other people's struggles their own, hence the internationalism of what they were doing. And they did this, I've argued, through the invention of passwords or the use of passwords. These were terms that were specific to Jewish practice and collective memory. And they applied these passwords to the contemporaneous struggles of non-Jewish minorities. These writers were attempting to translate other groups very untranslatable pain into terms and memories that were familiar to their own Jewish readers. So my hope is that the framework that I've developed for discussing this particular use of poetic passwords to create a vision of internationalism may be applicable to other groups. I'm on sabbatical this year at the Radcliffe Institute and I'm writing a, a book about contemporary Ukrainian writers and their post-Soviet vision of internationalism. And although Ukraine today is struggling against Moscow rather than on behalf of Moscow, I found some very interesting parallels which I might be able to share at the end, uh, time permitting. So I wanted to just give you a quick introduction to a few of the people that are on the, uh, the slide in front of you. Hey, Levik, who you see at the top left, uh, left his yeshiva to join the Jewish labor bund. He was arrested in 1906 for his revolutionary activity. He was sentenced to hard labor in Siberia. He ended up escaping from Siberia with the help of a revolutionary aid organization and made his way to the United States in 1913, where he became one of the world's most respected Yiddish poets uh, while trying to make ends meet as a wallpaper hanger. He wrote for the party organs, and then um, he actually even considered immigrating to the, to the USSR, but left the party in 1929 over an Arab uprising in Palestine, which the common turn supported. He would later rejoin and then leave again. Uh, David Hofstein, who is on the, uh, on the top in the middle, was a Yiddish modernist who was part of the Kiev Gruppe uh, immediately after the revolution. He ended up moving to Palestine for a year in the 1920s over his frustration with the banning of Hebrew in the Soviet Union, but he repented and moved back uh, where he ended up representing Yiddish within uh, the Soviet uh, 
uh, institutions of literature. He died in 1952 in what has been called the Night of the Murdered Poets, uh, alongside many other members of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee. On the top right, you see Esther Schumacher, who was born in Homel and immigrated at 10 to Canada, not long after the Homel pogrom. She met and married the very well-known Yiddish playwright and writer, Peretz Hirschbein, and the two of them spent about a decade traveling the world. They went to six continents, and she wrote of what she saw in East Asia, South America, Africa, the Middle East, to name a few of these places. Uh, on the bottom left, you see Aaron Kurtz, who was born into a Lubavitcher Hasidic family and ran away to join the circus. He was a circus hairdresser. Um, he emigrated to the United States at about 20 and uh, became a Communist Party member. And his personality is something of an enigma to me. Uh, his poems of tolerance and social justice belie his rigid adherence to the party line. He wrote a happy birthday poem to Stalin in 1949. Um, there were rumors of imprison the imprisonment of Soviet Yiddish writers while he was he was writing this poem. On the bottom left, uh, on the sorry, in the bottom middle, uh, you have Malka Lee, who also was born into a Hasidic family and broke ties with them because she wanted to be a writer. She fled to the United States on her own when she was seventeen. She worked in sweatshops. She studied at a teacher's college. Uh, she ended up running an inn in High Falls, New York, together with her husband, also a poet, Aaron Rappaport. And her family ended up dying in the Holocaust. Uh, and when she learned of this, most of her post-war writing turned to, uh, to Jewish trauma again. And then finally, Moisha Tafe, who you see on the bottom right-hand side, this is the only, uh, one of the only poets, we also have David Hofstein, who was a Soviet writer, but uh, Tafe uh, came of age as a, a proletarian poet under the auspices of MOP, of one of the proletarian movements. He was working in a wallpaper factory, so for some reason a lot of poets at the time were working with wallpaper. Um, he ended up being arrested in 1937 during the purges. He was released and volunteered for the front line as an artillery man. Uh, his wife and son died in the Minsk ghetto. After the war, he was rearrested in 1948, but he ended up surviving the murder of most Soviet Yiddish writers and continuing to write, although he switched to Russian at the end of his life. Uh, so the book that I wrote was my attempt to make sense of poets like these, who put their faith in a liberating world revolution during a time of rising nationalist movements. Um, the poems uh, that I am considering here describe the struggles of Chinese workers, of African Americans, of Ukrainian peasants, um, and uh, the passage from collective Jewish suffering to other people's suffering was a response to several different things. It was a response to the rise of fascism, as well as to specific world events, the Shanghai massacre of 1927, the Scottsboro trial of the early 1930s in the United States. Uh, but this poetry was also a direct response to the Soviet views on nationality and nationhood, which originated with Lenin's acknowledgement of the lasting strength of national differences, but that became stronger during the third period of the Comintern, which began around 1928 with the Sixth Comintern Congress. And this period marked Stalin's declaration that socialists were social fascists, but it also included the consideration of colonized agrarian peoples to be workers. So there was more at stake for Jewish uh, poets than party alignment, um, or even than empathy. Uh, the choice to describe other nations' struggles also affirmed and demonstrated Jews' successful modernization. Survivors of pogroms and czarist strictures, Soviet Jews were now part of a nation-building effort. East European Jewish migrants to North and South America, while still facing anti-Semitism, nonetheless sometimes passed for members of a privileged white majority. As recently as, as uh, 1920, Henry Ford, of course, had published a translation of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Um, but partly in response to this growing anti-Semitism and these outbursts, Jewish party-aligned writers sought to make social justice an international issue and not only a Jewish one. Um, so I want to share just a, a few examples of poems in the time that remains to me. Most of the Yiddish poets that I write about um, we're, we're focusing on the, this international world um, in the 1930s, but they tended to turn inward by the 1940s. 
but this this period that I'm writing about is a period of um, a kind of a kind of moment of awakening. It was uh, what I call the age of communist internationalism, beginning with Stalin's consolidation of power and ending with the disintegration of the Comintern in 1943. Um, in the early 20th century as well, you had Jewish modernists who were very focused on um, looking inward, on anti-Jewish grassroots violence, known as pogroms. The classic example of this is Chaim Nachman Bialik's Be'ira Harego, or In the City of Slaughter, which he wrote about the 1903 Kishinev pogrom. Kishinev, of course, is now in Moldova. Um, in 1903, there was this, this horrific pogrom, 49 people were killed, um, and Bialik's poem was a kind of grotesque form of reportage. He describes you know, the dried brains of the dead, and Bialik is simultaneously exalting human victims to the level of liturgy, and he's also undermining Jewish prayer through graphic descriptions of dead bodies, and um, you know, at the same time, he was also giving birth to a modernist Jewish national poetry. So the Jewish literary modernism that arose around the pogroms and around the sense of national catastrophe um, also created a moment of national solidarity. Um, in the final lines of this, of this poem, Bialik tells his readers to flee Eastern Europe for the desert. Well, if modernists like Bialik were creating a new poetic a new poetics and new aesthetics of uh, literary aesthetics around pogroms, then a quarter century later, party aligned internationalist poets were developing a new outgrowth of this modernist impulse. They were using many of the same images and many of the same devices, but they were applying these, these terms, these passwords to other groups. So an example of this would be Moisha Taif, uh, who, in 1929, condemned Zionism with his uh, uh, with this poem, uh, "Sing Desert Winds." Uh, so I'm just going to read to you the very beginning of what you see on the screen. Woe to the holy home, a city of slaughter. Woe to the holy resting places, a bloody sacrificial altar. No one has anointed you. You are uninvited guests. Um, so he's citing Bialik throughout the poem. He's talking about the city of slaughter, but his message is the opposite of Bialik's. Bialik provides a paratext to cite Jeanette. Um, he's asking readers to translate their outrage at pogrom violence to the plight of Palestinian Arabs who are losing their land. A little bit of context is needed to understand exactly what Taif is doing and how radical it is. This poem appeared following a week of violence in Palestine in late August of 1929. It left about 200 Jews and about 200 Arabs dead. Uh, the Israeli historian Hillel Cohen has called this year zero of the Arab-Israeli conflict. And the Comintern first condemned this violence as anti-Jewish, calling it a pogrom, but later revised this, calling it an uprising. And the aftermath of these events absolutely divided the Jewish left outside of the Soviet Union. It prompted many of those who had remained with the party to write poems in uh, solidarity with the Arab uprising, as, as well as others who um, did not agree with this common turn stance to leave the party. So I don't have space to talk about the rift here, but what I find really striking is that those who sided with the Arab masses used Jewish terms for their identification with a non-Jewish group. These were passwords drawn in this case directly from a Jewish pogrom poem. Now, I want to be really careful not to confuse writing about others with altruism. Tafe, who was living in the USSR at the time, had as many personal incentives for writing on behalf of a Palestinian uprising as his opponents had for writing on behalf of the Jews. And some of the internationalist literature that I consider comes off as patronizing, grandstanding, in some cases even appropriative. But I feel that in order to admire what they were trying to do, I as a reader also need to acknowledge this. Well, one of the writers who left over the uprising in Palestine is Hey Levick. And I wanna now turn to a password um, in a very different context that's drawn from a rabbinic source. Uh, so this is a poem by Levick written in August of 1928. Um, Levick was not as devout a communist as Tafe. Um, but he was very much aligned with the party newspapers in the, in the 1920s. And of course he had impeccable revolutionary credentials as a Bundist who had fled Tsarist Russia. This is a yard site poem, a poem 
in honor of the year death anniversary of Sacco and Vanzetti, the anarchists who were executed in Boston for suspected murder. And I'll just read the um, second half of the poem really quickly. No, this is the second half of one stanza of the poem uh, that you have on your slide. The same evil from accuser to accuser, from kategel to kategel in Yiddish. The same fist, the same power, Oh, we won't forget how the clock hands dripped with blood that August night. So Leivik is here identifying the perpetrators of the, uh, the death of Sacco and Bonsetti as the same evil from accuser to accuser. Uh, and Sacco and Bonsetti's accusers were the unjust US courts of law, as well as the Massachusetts governor, Alvin Fuller. But for Leivik, as for many Yiddish poets of his generation, the evil that oppressed Jews in Europe and anarchist immigrants in the United States was one and the same. And this poem calls upon fellow Jewish immigrants to fight the cycle of injustice that was perpetuated against innocent victims. The accuser or the kategel uh, would have stood out to readers. This is a classical rabbinic term for prosecutor. Um, a kategel in Yiddish, however, means a prosecuting angel who delivers a heavenly verdict. So for Leivik's left-wing Yiddish reader, a kategel was a password that admitted the non-Jewish Italian anarchists into a Jewish collective and, and into Jewish collective memory in the context of a humanitarian poem. Another example of a password, this one used as a kind of party shibboleth, is, uh, is Esther Schumacher. This is the Canadian Yiddish writer who had spent her 20s traveling with her very famous spouse, the playwright Peretz Hirschbein. Um, and you actually see at the top of your slide uh, their passport. Um, in the 1920s, you could have a passport with your spouse. Uh, so Schumacher was in East Asia in the late 1920s. And then together with, uh, with Peretz Hirschbein, she traveled to the Soviet Union and published a lot of her poems about East Asia, sometimes merging the themes with themes of the Soviet Union. Um, I'll just read for you really quickly this section from, uh, from one of them. This is called May Song, uh, published in 1928. I've sown my days in wanderings from the broad shores of the Yangtze to the Ganges. I have sought in dark eyes a familiar interpretation and recognized those eyes in the sound of the hammer and sickle. Schumacher's hammer and sickle moves beyond the demands of a password. It's a heavy handed party shibboleth. It marks the poem as internationalist and likens the workers on the banks of the Yangtze and the Ganges to the Jews building farming colonies in the Soviet Union at the time. What I find striking here is the idea of recognition. The dark eyes, which Schumacher later would use in other poems to describe herself in the Soviet Union, mark the ethnic other as something that is East Asian or something that is perhaps Jewish. Um, so read in tandem with the verse that she wrote about herself in Crimea, Schumacher's poems of East Asia emerges innovative experiments in merging the exoticized other with the exoticized Jew. There's a lot to say here about Schumacher's unreconstructed exoticizing of those that she met. And some of the things that Edward was saying about Tresikov really resonate with Schumacher's um, use of this idea of an Asian exotic. On the one hand, we find stereotype descriptions of geishas in some of her poems of Muslim men in others. On the other, she is performing the role of an exoticized Jewish self. Um, so I think I have time for a couple of very quick um, examples before I wrap up. Uh, some of the most striking examples of passwords in Yiddish poetry from the 30s come from uh, the period of the Scottsboro trial in the United States. Malka Lee uses the term Gotz Schwarzer Lam, or God's Black Lamb, to liken the victim of a lynching to Jesus. Um, and I'll uh, just read the second part of the poem that you have in front of you. The woods bowed low as if cut by a knife. Go back, go back. God's black lamb tore himself from the rope. Um, so at the time in the 1930s, pogrom victims were commonly cast as Jesus figures in Jewish 
uh, in Jewish poetry. And of course, this is a moment of resurgence of pogroms in Poland as well as in Nazi Germany. Similarly, internationalist left-oriented poets in the United States were using crucifixions to describe uh, victims of lynching in the US. And what you see in front of you is one of the very early crucifixion uh, motifs of Marc Chagall, Golgotha from 1912. In other cases, we see passwords used as, uh, as Trojan horses for writing about one's own group. So this is the inverse, the other uh, possibility of a, of a password that connects groups. David Hofstein, uh, who was in the Soviet Union in the 19th, throughout the 1930s, had written a pogrom poem called Ukraine or Ukraine in the 1920s. But after he returned to the Soviet Union from Palestine, Hofstein began writing patriotic poems about Soviet Ukraine. His 1944 poem, Ukraine, of course, written towards the end of World War II, casts Ukraine as a child who has emerged from the violence of the civil war and Nazi occupation. He could no longer write about specifically Jewish pain, even during World War II. So instead he wrote about a collective Ukrainian pain. And Hofstein um, had also spent a lot of time translating poems of alienation from the 19th century Ukrainian bard Shevchenko around the same time. So I believe that in this poem, he's using Ukrainian suffering as a way of talking about this increasing stricture on Jewish culture. This is just the very beginning of his 1944 Ukraine. From smoke and from woe and from ash and from shame, I see you lift your wounded hand, your head rises, pasted in blood. Well, the internationalist poets force a constant confrontation between the cynic in me and the optimist. To what degree is writing about others always a kind of Trojan horse for writing about oneself, even if we aren't living under the repressive conditions of Stalinism? Well, internationalism itself changed with World War II. By the end of the 1930s with the Hitler-Stalin Pact, Many Jewish writers were already beginning to return to Jewish topics to use passwords in the opposite direction from how they were being used in the early 30s. But Yiddish writers did return to a poetics of internationalism during the civil rights era. In the 1960s, integration led to violence and uh, in the United States and the Yiddish poet Aaron Quartz, this is the same poet who had uh, left his Hasidic family to join the circus and had written a happy birthday poem to Stalin in 1949. Uh, Quartz dedicated a poem, Kaddish, to the four black schoolgirls who were killed in 1963 in an Alabama church bombing. And in this poem, Quartz mourns multiple tragedies simultaneously. Um, I think he manages here to absorb the subjectivity of both the mourner and the implicated subject to cite Michael Rothberg. I'll end my presentation with a very brief uh, excerpt from this. He begins with the Kaddish prayer, Yiskadal vi Yiskadash, face to face with Abe Lincoln, face to face with the Negro martyred people. A rabbi says Kaddish. I am not a Kaddish sayer, but today mamas the world over bitterly wept and mourned the four black girls. I responded to the rabbi's Kaddish, Omein. So I conducted this research uh, over the last several years as a way of understanding a very specific community of writers. Uh, Jewish poets who were aligned with the party. And I wrote it as a salvage literary history, but I believe the concept of the password that emerged in the process uh, holds for other contexts. Um, and there are a couple of different directions that I plan to take this work. This is just on this slide, a kind of overview of what I've covered. Um, we've looked at different forms of password, the password, uh, the proof text password from Bialik, Talmudic passwords, uh, shibboleths, Christologic, uh, Christological passwords and passwords as Trojan horses. Um, so first of all, I, I'm not quite done with these Yiddish writers. I'm continuing to work on some of them uh, to explore how mutual these relationships may have been. Um, but one of the uh, goals that I have for my next project is to see how the password holds up in another group. Um, so I wanted to just share with you a, a very brief line from a recent Ukrainian poem. Um, my newest project takes me to a group of poets and artists who are working in Ukraine today. Um, and since 2014, these poets uh, have been thinking about Ukrainian identity on civic rather than national terms. So this has involved a broadening of historical narrative to include the collective traumas of other 
ethnic minorities in Ukraine, this broadening of the canvas away from an ethnocentric Slavic nationalism is, I believe, part of the ideology that's being violently attacked today. Um, so for example, Ukrainian writers are negotiating the relationship between Holocaust memory and the memory of very specifically Ukrainian tragedies from the past. This will obviously in the future uh, require more negotiations given the tragedy unfolding now. But in 2017, the Ukrainian poet Mariana Kianovska wrote a cycle of poems, Babunyar Holosame, or Babunyar in Voices. And um, the, the book aims at kind of telling the stories of these, these voices of murdered Jews during the Holocaust. But in one passage that you see here, we have a comparison of um, yours from, sorry, mine from 33 and yours from 41. Um, this is a direct comparison of the Ukrainian losses, the Ukrainian suffering from the Holodomor or the Ukrainian famine of 1933 and the Jewish loss in Babunyar in 1941. Um, the poet Serhii Jadan has praised Kianovska for this passage, noting that she subtly conveys that the two historical traumas are strongly interconnected. The experience of death must be combined, not divided. So as I get into this new project, I'm, um, I'm eager to look at the questions of representation from a very different angle, from a very um, relevant angle today, and to ask in light of the ongoing political entanglements, uh, whether uh, it's possible or appropriate for experiences of death to be combined or whether they must be um, continuously divided. So I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, Amelia. This was fantastic. Now, Steve will have to bring the presentations to a conclusion and make sense of all of commentary and aesthetics. Uh, so thank you to the Jordan Center. Thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Rosin, for bringing us together um, and for inspiring so much of my work through your scholarship and tireless optimism. Uh, I imagine I'm not the only one questioning my work amid what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, in the Ethnic Avant-Garde book, and also when Emilia and I came up with Commenter and Aesthetics, uh, one goal was to mine the ruins of the Soviet Union for some left alternative to uh, neoliberal globalization. But even before this war, it's been clear to me that figures like Putin and Xi Jinping have uh, likewise uh, been using the socialist past to shore up their illiberal visions of globalization, uh, visions farcically devoid of any ideological content. So for me, this panel is a good opportunity to start discussing where to go from here. Uh, as comparatists working with the former Soviet Union, how do we avoid getting sucked into this crushing new Cold War? How do we sidestep the new East-West binaries that suddenly seem like common sense, uh, but in a way that avoids the trap of restorative nostalgia? or nostalgia altogether. Uh, I don't know if rigorous reflective nostalgia is enough to save us at this point. Uh, this tragic and humbling point in time in which we're all just waiting to see how events will unfold. Uh, while watching the news these past months, uh, Amelia's songs in dark times, as well as um, her, uh, her current work on contemporary Ukrainian poetry um, uh, have been sources of, of sad comfort. Uh, what new passwords are being generated by this war? How can poetry help us to connect struggles that are familiar to us to struggles that are far away? Uh, how can one, uh, one ethnic group's trauma be transformed into inter-ethnic and interracial empathy, all while maintaining the distinctions between different groups? So for instance, her chapter on Hofstein's translations of Shevchenko into Yiddish show, uh, shows how in the bloodlands, poetry makes it possible to smuggle Jewish particularism and the traumatic history of pogroms into Ukrainian and Soviet literary spaces, even while acknowledging Shevchenko's own anti-Semitism. Uh, the tenuous balance between particularism and universalism that we find in every such encounter in Amelia's book offers a guide for speaking across boundaries in this current moment that seems ever more riven by racial and geopolitical divides. When Amelia and I came up with the concept of common and aesthetics, we wanted it to be as ecumenical as possible. Actually, I was leaning towards uh, common and modernisms myself, um, but she was the one who proposed common and aesthetics, and I'm glad she did since this term enabled us to sidestep the usual realism versus modernism, modernism debates that accompany discussions of interwar leftist culture. Uh, 
we envisioned a kind of atlas for this culture, uh, a new atlas for world, world literature, one that decentered the Paris of Casanova's World Republic of, of Letters, but that didn't simply posit Moscow as an alternate center. So these are the uh, you know, 16 chapters, uh, which, uh, which uh, perhaps will uh, broaden the, uh, the scope of our ensuing discussion. So part one tries to establish uh, the cultural and geopolitical networks that emerge from the common turn. So for instance, Harsha Ram talks about uh, Klebnikov at the 1920 Baku Congress of the Peoples of the East and then turns to his uh, utopian geopoetics. We have an earlier version of one of Katie's chapters from, Eur Eur uh, from Eurasia Without Borders uh, on writings about China in the wake of the 1927 Shanghai massacre. And her engagement here with Chris Manjapra's notion of a socialist uh, global ecumene breaking from top-down center for free models uh, resonates with several of the other contributions. For instance, Nehal Shingavi's contribution tracks how the All India uh, Progressive Writers Association navigated both British and Soviet influences as well as the local exigencies of 1930s Indian anti-imperialism. Uh, Sarah Ann Wells extends the ecumen further by showing how that same decade, modernist Brazilian artists and writers turned to the Soviet Union to articulate a quote, global simultaneity that served to counter notions of, of South American belatedness. Uh, the question, uh, the essays of part two, um, disrupt the boundaries of sensibly se separating modernism and realism, art and propaganda. Uh, so Nariyamam Skak of nuances, uh, Vladimir Papania's notion of culture one and culture two, uh, the notion that uh, Russian history moves in cycles, alternating between internationalism and nationalism an orientation towards the future versus an orientation towards the past, uh, artistic experimentation versus repressive monumentalism. Uh, Skakov nu uh, nuances this by positing uh, the existence of what he calls culture 1.5. Uh, Zhao Bing Tang uh, writes on 1930s Shanghai Street Theater, uh, Amelia uh, on Yiddish poetry during the Spanish Civil War, an early version of her chapter in Songs in Dark Times. Uh, and Jonathan Flatley and Christina Kyer on the representation of African-Americans and Afro-Cubans. Um, and then finally, uh, part three, um, the essays in part three and said all received historical narratives about the common turns rise and fall by advancing from the 1920s and 30s to the Cold War uh, and into the present. Uh, several of the pieces here document the missteps of the interwar years, uh, Papernia's open-ended culture one giving way to the repressive Stalinist uh, culture too. And Poperny and Krustalieva uh, state explicitly in their contribution that contemporary Russia seems to have lurched back into culture too. Uh, the open-ended internationalism of the 80s and 90s, um, according to them, have given, given way to, um, uh, to Putinism. Uh, however, part three also highlights uh, afterlives of Comintern aesthetics and post-war art and activism uh, in Black feminist writings, as Kate Baldwin shows, um, in ecumenical notions of socialist literature that emerged across East Europe, uh, as we see in Yevgeny Dabrenko's piece, and in the Samizdat Tamizdat of the 1920s, uh, sorry, of 1970s and 1980s East Germany, as we see in Katie Trumpner's piece. Uh, it was my job to write the introduction uh, for the volume in a way that connected these uh, very different texts and contexts. And my introduction follows a three-pronged strategy. Uh, first, I make a virtue of the common turn's many failings. Uh, the fact that its world revolution never came to be. Uh, the fact that it was always subservient to Soviet state interests, which of course led to the organization's disbanding in 1943. In other words, Moscow was an aspiring but failed center, a fact which prevents common turn aesthetics from becoming just one more center periphery model um, of world culture. Instead, the contributions show how the Soviet Union's allure persisted in a more, in a more dispersed, albeit melancholic way. Uh, in the introduction, I also follow the leads of scholars like Rosson and Robert Young in argue, arguing that the Comintern provides um, a sort of prehistory to post-colonialism. Second, I dive into the canonical debates between Brecht and Lukács, uh, collected in the Verso volume, Aesthetics and Politics, where Brecht is typically seen as the advocate for modernism and Lukács as the advocate for realism. Uh, but I don't think this divide is so absolute as evidenced by Brecht's embrace of an extant, expansive understanding of realism. Um, in Frederick Jameson's words, realism as uh, not a purely artistic and formal category, but rather an idea that governs the relationship of the work of art to, rea to reality itself, uh, characterizing a particular stance towards it. Uh, Jameson adds, the spirit of realism designates an active, curious, experimental, subversive attitude towards social institutions and the material world, uh, end quote. 
Uh, in short, this is a realism that Brecht and Lukács can agree upon, uh, a non-doctrinaire realism that undergirds Comintern aesthetics. However, a new spin on realism doesn't quite cut it given the difficult history at hand. Um, uh, though the common terms history can be woven into post-colonial genealogies, uh, this history of course also abounds with revolutionary failure um, and Stalinist terror. And this leads me to my final move in the introduction. Uh, I try to reorient the aesthetic in common term aesthetics away from art and literature per se, and towards a quote, sensual cognitive experience that is capable of resisting abusive powers self-justification. These are the words of Susan Buck Morris, who has been instrumental in turning attention away from Kantian aesthetics, centering um, a transcendental masculinist subject who purges himself of the senses to a quote, aesthetic system of sense consciousness, decentered from the classical subject where an extreme sense perception, sorry, where an external sense perceptions come together with the internal images of memory and anticipation. Uh, that is the aesthetic here refers to inner and outer sensations mediated by the body's surface, and Buck Morris shows how in the 1930s, when confronted with this aesthetics of the surface, Walter Benjamin was able to discern its competing political applications, uh, while, the aesthetic, uh, sorry, while the aestheticized politics of fascism worked as an anesthetic to numb the organism, to deaden the senses, to repress memory. In contrast, the politicized art of communism was to lay bare fascism's manipulation of the senses uh, and turn attention uh, to actual material relations. Uh, following uh, Benjamin's lead, uh, Buck Morris forwards a radical aesthetic that foregrounds the sensory rather than any particular form, uh, an aesthetic bound uh, not to art or realism, uh, but to corporeal material nature. Like Lukács and Brecht, she seeks a critical grasp of capitalist totality, uh, but unlike Lukács and to a lesser extent uh, Brecht, she doesn't specify what, su what successful progressive politicized art should look like, only what it is supposed to accomplish namely a sensory experience that allows for critical cognition and therefore a potential source of resistance against oppressive, critical, uh, oppressive cultural practices. This expansive notion of aesthetics is appealing not only because it allows for a variety of expressive forms, but because it also allows us to register both, both the promise and the failure of common term aesthetics. Uh, that is, Buck Morris's expanded aesthetic makes it possible to grasp not just the layered, um, uh, artistic styles and methods uh, competing for uh, primacy within the interwar left, but also the contradictory experiences and sensations that the history of the common turn necessarily elicits. Uh, not just realism and modernism, but also what Richard Wright described as the horror and glory of 20th century communism. Such broadly felt experiences of illusion and disillusion came to fill in the failed and absent center of the third international. And Buck Morris's sensory aesthetic enables us to register this, uh, to register without necessarily discarding the unfulfilled hopes of 20th century communism. Ultimately then the volume identifies not only a variety of forms, but also feelings. Uh, the key here is a socialist way of, way of feeling that continues to re reverberate across spatial and historical contexts, uh, common turn aesthetics as a means of forging collective mobilizing emotions. A point which in the volume is best advanced by Jonathan Flatley's piece on Langston Hughes's communist aligned poetry. Another good case in point here um, is uh, Bojang's concluding piece, which connects the mobilizing role of anger in workers theater from 1920s China to a contemporary uh, Chinese workers art collective called the New Workers Art Troupe. Uh, Zhang's piece describes the troupe's plays and concerts for migrant workers and argues that perhaps such outreach would benefit from more anger about China's ever worsening class inequality. Um, since China is one of the sort of connecting threads for our panel, I thought I'd just dwell um, um, a bit on, on China and how the, the volume sort of leads to China. Um, in 2017, uh, while the volume was stuck in the middle of the publication process, uh, Bo, uh, Bo, Katie, and I uh, visited the New Workers Art Troupe on the outskirts of Beijing, where they had an exhibit and concert space. Um, and I'll just show you some, uh, some images from, from this trip. Uh, the trip for me was the culmination of, of the Common Turn Aesthetics Project. Uh, and so, uh, so I'll start by showing photos from, uh, from Beijing. So here is the New Workers Art Troupe. Uh, again, on the outskirts of Beijing. A short walk away, we also visited the troops uh, school for the children of migrant workers, uh, 
who lacked access to, uh, to Beijing schools since they weren't officially registered as Beijing residents. But it was, not, it was an uncertain time for the troop. Uh, this was in the middle of a crackdown on NGOs supported by foreign funding. Uh, the school had been shut down. Um, the neighborhood was slated for redevelop redevelopment, and the troop was planning to relocate to a farm further away from the city. However, the main point of our trip to China had been to visit Yan'an. Katie's book ends with a discussion of Mao's 1942 Yan'an talks in literature and art, which she describes as a hybrid of authoritative Soviet positions and vernacular Chinese models. She writes that Mao's understanding of national form resonated with, but also differed from Soviet national form. If in the Soviet case, national form was expressed through quote, high style ethics and odes on contemporary themes disguised as folk ballads. In contrast, uh, Mao's vision of national form led to the promotion of traditional performances like Yanga, uh, a motley collection of songs, dances, and folk plays often bearing sexual and religious undertones. So that's from Katie's uh, uh, final body chapter. In turn, uh, Ed's epilogue ends by uh, connecting uh, contrasting understandings of national form to the eventual Sino-Soviet split. In a recent, uh, recently published piece, I've also tried to think about Mao's 1942 Yan'an talks in relation to Soviet models, in particular by noting how the 1942 talks shared with the 1934 Soviet Writers' Congress a tension between performative speech acts and theatricality. And I end this piece by trying to connect these events to our disillusioned present, uh, more precisely to Xi Jinping's 2014 Forum on Literature and Art, where he pressed literature and art workers to, cent to center and serve the people and to carry forward the banner of the socialist core value system, the primary value being patriotism. Artists and writers were to reflect the system via a vivid, vigorous, lifelike manner and were to employ true to life images to tell people what they should affirm and praise and what they must oppose and deny. The result would be the attainment of quality, virtue, righteousness, and beauty. In short, Xi's speech was a straightforward endorsement of patriotism and realism, as well as a clear attempt to solidify his relationship, sorry, to solidify his leadership by performing Mao's same role from Yan'an 1942. Curiously, Xi also echoed Stalin by calling artists and writers um, engineers of the souls, a description not found in the Yan'an talks, and yet there was obviously no sense in the 2014 speech of the Soviet-inspired anti-capitalist ontology that scholars like Petra Petrov had discerned at the 1934 Soviet Writers' Congress. Instead, Xi's point seemed to be to, uh, to invoke the very heaviest hitters of state socialism in a way that augured the heightened censorship and repression of contemporary China. This was not yet a foregone conclusion when Katie Bo and I visited Yan'an in 2017. We saw the brick building where the CCP's seventh Congress took place under the profile pro, uh, portraits of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Stalin. Visitors posed behind the podium for photos, some raising arms in mock declamation. Uh, next door in the small room where the 1942 conference met, tour guides regularly broke into song. Above the valley floor, one could explore at will the caves where Mao and other officials, um, uh, where Mao and other officials live, uh, lived. There was nothing cordoning off this seem, uh, the seemingly untouched beds, decks, uh, desks, and bookshelves. We figured security was unnecessary since all of the other visitors were party members. Uh, the wealthy elite of Chinese society, uh, they were walking around in festive groups, some wearing matching uniforms and carrying portable seats for impromptu, impromptu lectures. There was an air of idyllic back to basics rejuvenation. There was also plenty of cause for cynicism. Across the street from one of the cave sites, a massive new cultural complex featured a 1938 themed food court and multiple theaters along a glass fronted chandeliered lobby lobby, an actor dressed as Mao posed for photos. We saw a musical about uh, May 4th intellectuals abandoning Shanghai for Yan'an, where they labored, fought, and fell, fell in love alongside peasants and shoulders, the soldiers. Uh, the plot was overwhelmed by numerous uh, dance numbers, um, as well as gymnasts dangling from hoops and ropes above stage and audience. Uh, the musical began 
with a soldier suspended from a rope and running along an animated map tracing the Long March, March's route and concluded with red confetti raining down on us. It seemed like empty, glossy spectacle, and yet the next day at the Lusion Art Academy site, as the sole visitors to an exhibit on the 70, 75th anniversary of the Anon Talks, we saw now uncannily familiar photos of young dance from that time, uh, as well as old woodblock prints of soldiers dangling from ropes. The glossy spec spectacle had faithfully echoed Mao's mandate to serve the masses, national form recoded as commercial entertainment with just the faintest hint of communism specter. Um, so I'll end uh, with that, um, just with this um, uh, sense of, of perhaps disillusion, um, my own uncertainty about how to proceed from here. Um, and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, uh, thank you to everybody for really doing this inhuman labor of uh, condensing such enormously rich books into 25 minutes. Um, as we have uh, just <laughs> another 20 minutes for the discussion, and, and as we wait for uh, questions to appear, I will start with two of my own. Um, first to all, again, these are questions to all four of you. Uh, what would you have done differently with hindsight um, now that your book is finished? Um, and secondly, uh, what are the, you know, maybe for the benefit of scholars in search of topics, what are the white spots on Comington aesthetics, or, or at least your own sector of this scholarship? I, I guess I could say a few things um, of the of the many things I might do differently, um, which is always a difficult question to uh, to take on. Um, so I think I think as I I like many people probably writing books like this, you go, it's a sort of strange temporal process, right? Because it begins at, at an early stage. And then for me, it came out of my dissertation, I was really working things constantly. And then as I was doing so, I kind of um, came upon uh, other people's work quite late in the project that was quite closely related and then sort of reformulated things in relationship to that. So I ended up having a kind of epilogue that was a sort of squeezed version of what I think really should have been probably a, another chapter or could have been a sort of different way of organizing the book that focused more on the, on the 1930s. Um, so that's one thing I think I would have done and I probably would have tried also to introduce, I mean, this is partly my original plan for the book was to actually have more of a balance between um, Soviet and Chinese writing. Um, so I wanted to talk about some of the uh, travelogues about the Soviet Union that were written about, about by Chinese writers in the 1920s. Um, partly that's something that, that Katie talk, that deals with in her book and partly something that Elizabeth McGuire deals with in, in her book. So that's one of the other reasons why I kind of ended up leaving that out. But I think that's something I would have done slightly differently. I think my, my emphasis over the course of, the, of writing the book did somewhat change as well. Um, I think I was initially quite inspired, and this may go down to some of what Stephen was saying, by the, when I started looking at these early Soviet accounts of China and the way in which, um, the way in which they seem to be articulating a kind of early version of what, as someone sort of trained in the early 20th century academy, I recognize as a sort of post-colonial theory, right? Um, this stuff about how do you overcome exoticism? How do you overcome this notion of different global spaces inhabiting different temporalities, right? This idea of China is trapped in some kind of eternal traditional past that can only be kind of consumed as some sort of exotic delicacy, but can't be thought of as sort of coeval and connected to the same revolutionary modernity. Um, that was something that obviously for anyone who's sort of been trained in kind of Ebert Said, Johannes Fabian and so on and so forth feels very familiar, right? So that was the sort of thing I focused on first, overwhelmingly, this idea of Tretyakov as a sort of early post-colonial theorist. And later on in the course of writing the book, I think I became increasingly, I increasingly had the sense that I sort of overemphasized that in some ways and maybe downplayed the ways in which 
Um, he remains uh, both an agent of the of the Soviet state, right? And that, that's something that actually, you know, in a contemporary moment, uh, I find increasingly troubling, right? The sort of abiding role of of state power in shaping this entire formation that I discuss, um, but also the way that he's actually invested in imposing a particular model of temporality, really, onto, onto the China that he describes. And that's something that I try to sort of accommodate with this idea of centrifugal and centripetal forces. But fundamentally, I, fundamentally, I think there is still a form of, I guess you could call it epistemic violence that Tsukov is, is constantly imposing on China with this notion that China is following the revolutionary development of the Soviet Union, right? Um, and I think I became more interested towards the end of the book in, term, in thinking about the way in which China and the Soviet Union could both be positioned within a sort of common um, global modernity that is formed by capitalism and responses to capitalism and the imperialism that capitalism generates without reducing China to essentially just a step behind on the same level of revolutionary development that the Soviet Union mandates, right? So just as this idea of the kind of five-stage pititienka of development um, is emerging in the, in the, in the late 20s, um, China is increasingly positioned as just on a certain stage on that. Um, so if I was going to refashion, I think I would put onto that. Um, as, as for the white spots, I feel like there are, they're sort of endless. <laughs> and um, I think may, mainly I feel like we just should encourage people to, to identify different sort of strands of this, this global picture that have yet to be filled in, um, that may be in many ways beyond my own vision. Anybody else? take up these questions to, to Well, I'm happy to talk about the white spots. Um, I mean, yeah, there obviously are things that I would change about the book too, but um, mostly I would have loved to have included a chapter on the Caucasus, which I was at work on and still will publish as an article, but it was just the book had gotten too long and my editor had sort of given me a firm cutoff. And so I just saved that for later. Um, but I'm sure I'll think of lots of things. Um, the the white spots, I mean, this, this is something that I've been thinking a lot about, and I would love to just kind of put out a rallying cry to the field to help. Um, I think we're still, well, <laughs> on the eve of the current invasion, um, I think that we were still a field that was sort of, that, that saw a binary opposition between the ideology of the Soviet Union, which was problematic, but somewhat internationalist and the ideology of a certain kind of nationalism that people had seen emerging in and around 1989. And I have been trying to trouble that with um, you know, my own newer work on Ukraine, but I, I think it's something that the field needs to look closely at that you know, just because Moscow has abandoned internationalism <laughs> doesn't necessarily mean that we need to absolutely reject the entire enterprise as something that's not worth studying or looking into. You know, many of us got into this field because we were taken by the utopianism of, of a particular generation in the interwar period, despite seeing the, the flaws to that. Um, but we also, of course, can't look at that as if it's stagnant, as if um, that utopianism somehow remained. And so I think the question is, how do we how do we broaden an understanding of, um, of internationalism to include different forms and perhaps 21st century forms? Um, and so that's kind of an open call to, uh, to think critically about, about that, um, that opposition. Fantastic, Katie. I would do actually it's 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 a it's not very useful to our discussion, but I, I would I would shorten the book by lopping off some of the some of the things that I discussed in certain chapters. I think certain chapters could be more streamlined by not trying to cover so many topics in one chapter. But that's that's not really relevant to today's discussion. But but uh, but uh, apropos uh, actually of, of of what's just been said. Uh, the one thing that I would would change or or at least try to elaborate more fully is the whole question of imperialism, colonialism, and so forth, which, which I, I, I say at one point that, that, that uh, the, Soviet, that the Soviet Union was, was not really an imperialist country, but I dismiss it very, very quickly in the space of about one sentence. And I don't have an answer, but it, as I'm writing my book on, on uh, Chinggis Atmatov, the whole issue of the extent to which uh, 
the term colonialism applies to what, what the Soviet Union was doing vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis its, its, its ethnic minorities and, and, and republics, um, it's something I, I really have to res resolve and I, I do not have any resolution, but it's something that, that I am tackling at the moment. And I think, I think were I to rewrite the book, which I will never do, but were I to rewrite the book, I would try to look more, more closely at that whole issue. Can, I can speak quickly and, and just note that, um, that you know, with Common Aesthetics, just editing this 600-page 600, 600 volume, we realized that, that we could not be comprehensive. Uh, the volume is, um, uh, I think, by design, uh, very, much, uh, very much shies away from Western European countries. Uh, sometimes, uh, I think in retrospect, that, that seemed a bit arbitrary to, to, to not mm -hmm. feature pieces on leftists in, in Western Europe. Um, when we talked about uh, United States, it was, it was only through the, uh, through the lens of African-Americans. Um, um, again, this was my own sort of uh, orientation, I think in my own scholarship, but it became clear you know, as we were finishing publication that, that no, there were just so many other channels that could be pursued uh, through this expansive notion of common turn aesthetics. Um, in addition, uh, I can talk about, um, um, in my own research, where I'm trying to go from here is, is uh, uh, trying to think about, uh, and this is in keeping with Amelia talking about different internationalisms, uh, you know, the allure of, of the far left and leftist internationalisms vis-a-vis -vis the allure of, of right internationalisms. Um, I think since 2016, it's become clear to me that, that perhaps we, we, we neglected to focus on, on this other sort of counter to um, to liberal visions of globalization, liberal capitalism, um, and, and these have become so, so very potent. Um, and so trying to think about these, and in my case, thinking about these in relation to East Asia, the proximity of the Soviet Union and the Japanese empire, the imprint this, this has left on um, Asian American writing. Uh, this is where I'm going from here. Um, Great, so uh, Katie, did you have do you have your hand? Uh, yes, I just, the, 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 third, the third thing I wanted to mention actually is that I think I should have, it's, the book is called Eurasia Without Borders, but it primarily looks at the Soviet Union and Asia. And I think I would, would if I rewrote it, I would include uh, more of a European dimension. I mean, there, there are some European writers there, but I would include more. In particular, in my work on, on I might have I've come to look into, into Louis Aragon. Who, who was a, a, an office bearer in the Comintern Literary Organization uh, in the early 1930s when it was formed, um, and uh, who played an enormous role in, in mediating between, uh, subsequently, between, between Asian and, and non-European writers and, and European writers between the Soviet Union and, and France. And I think that I, think that I would try, I, you know, I, I include the English dimension the German dimension, but I think the French dimension should have been covered as well. Great. So I see Ed's hand, and then we we start with Sam. And I, just, I just wanted to make a very quick note um, that links to what I think Amelia and Stephen have been saying about both kind of thinking about contemporary forms of internationalism and the question of, of right internationalism. So one of the things I've been very struck by in terms of the um, forms of political discourse that have been coming out of the Russian Federation in relationship to this war is this idea that um, Russia is reclaiming its role as the global leader of anti-imperialism, right? It's one of these examples of, in an orientation of, towards the, the global south, essentially. Um, and it's, it's a striking example, and a, a grotesque example, but a striking example of how certain forms of, sort of political discourse um, that are inherited from the Soviet Union can, can still be repurposed in this contemporary moment, right? So these certain notions that go way back to, you know, the Baku Congress um, are, still, are still circulating and still being kind of dusted off and redeployed. Um, so I think absolutely we as, as scholars who are invested in these questions can, can work against that, right, by thinking about um, what, the, what the forms of contemporary internationalism might actually be and what kinds of forms might be able to counter these, these sorts of, of, of state-driven narratives. Absolutely. So, Sam? And anybody else who has final questions to ask? Yeah, thank you all for, I mean, well, first for your books uh, and, and second for this lovely panel. Um, uh, 
And I wondered whether, I mean, since this is sort of under the auspices of a Slavic department or in a, a Russian study center, I wondered whether you could talk a bit about your encounters with Soviet scholarship on the literature that you've written about. Um, because there, I mean, there was such a developed, you know, field of friendship of people's literary scholarship that in some ways is the the closest predecessor of world literature studies as we know it today. I mean, for better and for worse. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, and it was deeply philological. Um, it, it was often meticulous in its, uh, you know, uh, prosopography, its tracing of, of people and texts. Um, and it was also, you know, problematic in all sorts of ways. And I wondered what kinds of encounters you had with the Soviet scholars who wrote about these people that you wrote about. I mean, I can I can just say that um, in in the case of the Soviet Yiddish writers, um, many of the pieces that I was looking at are pieces that were absolutely written off by American scholars because they were seen as propagandistic and whatever. So the only work that had been done on things like Markish's Spanish Civil War poems was done by Soviet scholars who took it seriously because there was a charge to take it seriously. And um, that was really, it was, it was very striking that, you know, you have a couple of lines in American scholarship that say, yeah, then there was this really Stalinist poem. Okay, next. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's absolutely essential to go back to the Soviet scholarship, maybe read, you know, <laughs> wade through some of the convoys and things like that that are in there just, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to officially pass the test and then look at, at ways that, um, that, some of this work was being read. Um, so, yeah. I could say just that, um, in, I mean, in my work, it's not so much a question of looking at Soviet philology, um, but one, things I, one of the things I do look at a little bit in the book and also in a piece that I have uh, coming out in another of, another of Rossum's wonderful endeavors, which is a, a collective volume on Soviet world literature, uh, is a piece about the translation of of contemporary Chinese fiction uh, in, in, in the, the 20s and 30s into Russian, uh, which was happening particularly through the journal uh, International Literature, which uh, both Wilson and Katie have also written about. Um, and there, there's a very interesting dynamic to me of trying to emphasize con translating contemporary writing, which is a, re a very new dynamic, right? That's actually the first project of translating Chinese literature uh, in the early, very early Soviet period connected to Gorky's uh, Mirovaya Literatura project are about translating the Chinese classics. Um, but from the late 1920s on, there's this interest in trying to translate to contemporary uh, leftist uh, fiction writers, uh, typically realists, uh, people like uh, Mao Dun, uh, Ding Ling, Lu Xun, um, who are broadly associated with the sort of Chinese literary left in Shanghai and the League of, of Left-Wing Writers. Um, and that to me is, is, is an interesting example of attempting to sort of position Chinese literature within this, this vision of um, a, a, a sort of what Rosson calls a People's Republic of Letters, right? This kind of uh, transnational network of, um, of, of global leftist writing. Uh, one of the things that is interesting to me is actually, I look at a little bit of how some of those translation strategies um, actually try to, erase some of the more sort of modernist, aesthetically complex elements that you see in, in figures such as Lu Xun. Um, so the translations of him uh, from the late 1930s actually take out a lot of his very strange sort of, sort of um, de defamiliarizing metaphors and stories like medicine. Um, but that I think is another rich resource for this way in which quite sort of serious intellectual and scholarly resources are being put into this project of, of creating a, a literary international at this time. Great. If Steve or Kate have anything to add, or if there is one last question as we are approaching the uh, the final minute of <laughs> well, well, Ross, and you haven't talked about your book. I think perhaps you could talk about your book and what, what you might do differently. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you. I well, um, <laughs> uh, well, I. You know, my book, I, you know, I deliberately try to keep out from, from this panel. Uh, but, um, you know, I, but let, you know, since you asked the question, you know, I would really, uh, really refer you to, uh, to 
uh, review Sam wrote uh, on my book, uh, which, which really, you know, very, <laughs> very justly noted the main mission, uh, especially given my title from internationalism to post-colonialism, that I barely and only the, the epilogue talk about uh, post-colonial studies and its relationship is the field to, um, to the cultural formations I had been, Soviet link cultural formations I had been studying um, in, in that book. So, uh, so, you know, this more meticulous elaboration of, of actually the, the, the practical connections between uh, post-colonial studies is a field which unfortunately, I mean, say for uh, Robert Young's, uh, um, you know, fantastic history, which ends in, you know, pretty much with Said. Really, there is no proper history of post-Said, post-colonial post studies that I could draw on. Um, and that, you know, made, made difficult the, the elaboration of those connections, but, but really this is the, the biggest gap and I had to rush my book into existence for reasons I'm not entirely proud of, and that left uh, unfinished. But, um, uh, you know, I really loved Amelia's formulation also of, uh, um, you know, what has the war uh, that Putin has uh, declared a month and a half ago, um, you know, if its implications on, on the kind of scholarship we are producing. And um, yes, unfortunately, you know, these are not uh, particularly hopeful, <laughs> uh, hopeful implications, but, um, you know, like Amelia also remain for me in, uh, in thinking there is really so much to be um, an erased and salvaged of so socialist internationalism. And, uh, um, you know, even against this much grimmer context that, that the war has put on it. So I really <laughs> did not want to put myself at the, at the end, you know, I was hoping to to avoid it, but uh, I have to say, uh, the four of you have been really like a just concert, a quartet, you know, and partly because your work, uh, your books were written in conversation with each other, you know, which really doesn't happen so frequently at such panels. So it was such a pleasure to uh, to listen to all of you, and uh, you know the. Um, Sure, so many more questions to to answer. So much, so many white spots still to cover. That uh, I'm really looking forward to our future conversations and and encounters. So let me end on this note and to thank you all so much for sharing your you know these scholarly triumphs with us. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Thank you so much, Russell. Thank you, Russell.